We're joined by two very interesting guests today who will help us understand the clinical continuum of ultrasound in medicine, Dr. Chris Fox and one of his students, Joel Schlang. Guys, why don't you introduce yourselves and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about you. Sure, so uh, my name is Chris Fox and I am a professor of emergency medicine and I am the director of the Emergency Ultrasound Fellowship and I'm also the assistant dean for student affairs at the University of California, Irvine. I spend probably 80% of my time training medical students in ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And I'm Joelle Schlang. I just graduated from medical school at University of California, Irvine, and I am now a first-year resident in emergency medicine at University of California, Irvine. Excellent. So it's an exciting time for you, I can imagine. It's an exciting time for you as being an innovator in education. So I would imagine that if we're going to have ultrasound as a cornerstone of practice, we're going to have to start educating our medical students early on. So help me understand how that educational process starts through medical school and how it continues through. Yeah, of course. You know, you think about the training that we go through to become a doctor, and there's the whole continuum of undergraduate medical education or medical school, graduate medical education, residency, and then you're finally trained and you're working your daily practice. I think pushing ultrasound all the way to day one of that undergraduate medical school experience, I think, is really important to lay down the foundation that one's going to need as they go through the rest of that training continuum. So we start right in the very first week of medical school. We have medical students with the machines and we show them how the machines work, how they turn on, the physics behind it. And that can, we continue to integrate ultrasound training throughout their whole first two years of medical school. And so by the time they get ready to enter the wards and the clinics, and the emergency department in their third year of medical school, they've already had up to 50 hours of training on the machines. So, Joelle, when did you first clutch an ultrasound probe? It was my very first day of medical school in my first year. Uh, I was lucky enough to be the first class to have ultrasound integrated into my medical education from the very first day of medical school. So it's interesting that, that the ultrasound machine or the procedure was really right up front in terms of you learning about, about medicine. Was it more of a clinical tool of, of diagnosis? Was it more of a, um, a tool for anatomy? How did it first come into play in medical school? It was a tool for everything all throughout medical school, including um, making diagnosis and also learning the anatomy. I think that uh, those two things went really well together. Um, in the first year of medical school, as we were going through our anatomy course, we learned the ultrasound anatomy right alongside uh, when we were learning the anatomy on the cadavers. Uh, so we would learn the anatomy from our books and on the cadavers, and then we would learn the anatomy using ultrasound on our standardized patients. So Dr. Fox, take me through that continuum, if you will. So we've got a first year medical student using ultrasound as a learning tool. Then we've got clinicians in practice using it as a clinical tool. So it seems to be a rich opportunity to expand the role of ultrasound across medicine. Are, are students more sophisticated than some of the attendings as they move through your program? We, we see this quite a bit where um, a, a millennial, somebody from the millennial generation or generation Y is teaching somebody who's generation X, my generation, or even somebody who's a baby boomer. And so you see this reverse peer-to-peer uh, uh, peer teaching, if you will, where a medical student actually knows how to operate the machine better than the person supervising them, and they know how to make the diagnosis, they know how to be accurate, more accurate with that machine than the person supervising them does. And so it requires uh, this, the medical student to navigate that communication pathway, and it requires on the other end, the millennial or the generation Xer, to be receptive to that type of uh, reverse educational process, if you will. I like the fact that you use the word navigate, which I think is probably a little bit, should be in quotes, yeah, I could imagine. a little bit. It's, there's the, it's tough for somebody to, when you're so involved in a teaching role, it's tough for the student suddenly becomes the teacher, and it can be tough for some people to, to reverse the role like that. Both the student and the teacher, it can be tough that so way. So how does the inclusion of ultrasound in medical education and clinical practice change just the fundamental aspects of medical school and care? It seems like there are significant changes. 
Sure. So, well, in medical school, there's a concept called active learning, and uh, active learning is when you're not just sitting in a classroom listening to somebody professing at the podium uh, or reading something in a book. You're actually doing something hands-on. You're actively learning the material with your hands and with the ultrasound probe. So when you're flipping through an anatomy textbook, and even when you go to cadaver lab and you're cutting into the, the cadaver, certainly that's, there's some active learning there, but that's on a, on, a, on a still object. But when you're performing an ultrasound on a live human and you're seeing the color flow Doppler connect all the vasculature together, it's like your anatomy books and your cadaver sort of come to life right there, and that's active learning. So that's really where the, the crux of ultrasound is taught in medical school. It, it fulfills that active learning component that everybody's struggling to meet. In clinical practice, the way it's changing, the way we think about how we see our patients is that we can, we're much more self-propelled as clinicians. And you could be an emergency physician, a critical care doctor, primary care doctor, anesthesiologist, any, any different type of physician is going to be more self-propelled at the bedside using a tool that allows them to look through the skin at the organs they're interested in. And so I think that that transforms that the role of the clinician into one that is much more personalized, and even proactive with their patients, and uh, less of a passive role where you're ordering some tests and waiting for them to come back, and you ordered a bunch of extra tests you didn't need. So I think that's really transforming, I think, the role of the, of the clinician with their patients, that doctor-patient relationship gets transformed right there and then with an, when the physician themselves performs the ultrasound. So let's try to unpack that. That was, there was a lot of interesting things there. Um, more efficient care. You talked about ordering less tests. In, in the era of cost containment and healthcare reform, these are real important um, issues. Help me understand that a little bit better about ordering less tests or being more proactive in care so that the clinical journey is efficient perhaps both from a financial and, and an outcome perspective. Yeah, um, I, I was told recently that by the year 2018, we're going to need to reduce our costs of healthcare by 25%. So everybody's trying to figure out how to get there by 2018. I think that one of the ways my students are gonna get there is by being more accurate at the bedside and not ordering as many tests that are unnecessary because See, when you perform an ultrasound yourself on the patient, then you're already crossing off a bunch of things off your list, and it's making you uh, much more lean in what you do next. The easiest thing to do is to just shotgun a bunch of lab tests and then do a bunch of expensive imaging with CAT scans. I think that to be more lean, you really focus in, you hone down what the issues are with the ultrasound at the bedside, it slices like CT scans or slices. The accuracy for ultrasound is way higher than it is for the physical exam alone. And so mm -hmm. when you use that slice imaging modality at the point of care, I think it makes you more accurate and reduces costs. So this idea of visual medicine, where you can actually visually assimilate data to help you understand whether it be a clinical profile, disease pathology, or, or treatment. Is that an emerging trend? Is that relevant to the story of ultrasound because it's so highly visual? I believe it really is. I mean, when I can show the patient the reason why they're vomiting, or the reason why they can't breathe, or the reason why they can't see, when I can show them their pathology on a portable imaging device, I think there's no greater form of visualization right there and then than having the patient actually visualize and say, oh, there's my retina, there's my gallstone, there's my pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, pulmonary edema. When you show the patient these things, and the patient can recognize it, or the patient's families in the room, they can recognize it, I think that's connecting the doctor and the patient at the highest level in terms of visualization in medicine. That's a fascinating concept because we know that patients are often disconnected from care, that we tell them they have coronary artery disease or hypertension, and we try to articulate the clinical sequelae of these conditions, but it, they still don't get it. Mm. Do you think that ultrasound could be not only a diagnostic tool, but a patient aid? 
a visual aid to help drive compliance and care and, and, and that kind of communication that is often broken? Absolutely. I think uh, if you just use the example of congestive heart failure and trying to reduce the readmission rates for congestive heart failure, a lot of that has to do with patient education, patient compliance, and one way to help usher that conversation is conversation in would be to show them show the patient themselves the poor contractility of their heart and what a normally squeezing heart would look like and show them the difference in why their heart can't handle the salty foods and the extra fluids the way this other heart over here is really squeezing really well i think that gets at that patient education at the core that's interesting. Joel, in your experience, how do patients respond with some of these visual cl clues that they can actually see a disease process? Is that a powerful visual for them? Absolutely. The patient response is overwhelmingly positive. They love that you're spending the extra time with them right at the bedside. They love seeing their organs being able to be explained on their actual the images of their actual organs why they're experiencing the symptoms that they're experiencing, what they can do to, you know, alleviate their symptoms or, you know. So it's absolutely a powerful tool. And I think that the more patients understand their disease processes, the better they'll be able to, you know, comply with lifestyle modifications or medication regimens in order to improve their condition. I'm gonna use another big complicated clinical word here to try to encapsulate what you're thinking. I'm, I'm curious, is it cool? Do patients kind of have that wow moment? And how is that a powerful stimuli to engaging them in driving compliance or care? Well, I, I can tell you that um, when I, I'm an emergency physician, so mm -hmm. when I see a patient, uh, this is, my work is very episodic with these patients. I don't have a long-term patient doctor relationship. So I need to get to that doctor-patient relationship as fast as possible. And I think one of the things that helps me do that is the cool factor of doing an ultrasound. They remember me as the doctor that came in and performed an ultrasound. They'll often tell me, I remember you, doctor. I was here three years ago and you performed an ultrasound on me. And I'm looking at this person like I've never seen them before. And then sometimes they might make a joke about me looking like Phil Collins or something. Like This usually comes up. And, but, uh, but it is, it is really, I think, it's the cool factor. I feel like I have an extra skill set when I go see my patients. I feel like I have an extra, you know, trick of the trade. And when I go see them, maybe it's a foreign object in their foot that's been bothering them for three weeks, and I get to go in there and, and show the patient, oh, actually, there is something here. I just found it. You could see this hypochoic rim of inflammation around it. I'm going to get that thing out of you right now. And that does feel cool. That's neat. So let's take a 30,000 foot view as we kind of wrap up our discussion today and talk about the Ultrasound Institute and how that frames up um, uh, an academic template for driving your vision forward. Sure. So the Ultrasound Institute at UC Irvine is a place where the entire continuum of ultrasound education will occur. And this will be have a global presence and we'll teach everything from medical students correlating ultrasound with anatomy and physiology and the physical examination to residents coming in and getting training on performing procedures to continuing medical education to physicians out there who didn't get the training during medical school or residency who are trying to close the gap on their, on their training paradigm. And so we're going to have that point of care ultrasound institute to train everybody in the United States, we're close to the Pacific Rim in UC Irvine, so I can see a lot of people coming over from Asia and Australia. And so it's gonna be a global presence that way. That's great. So it looks like ultrasound and many of our patients are in good hands. Thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you.